Hello there. This is continuing with the MASM Jeff Wang sort of tutorial, which isn't the best tutorial in the world, but in some regard, it just it covers a lot of the most important essential stuff for ASM, and it looks pretty handsome, whatever. So I've been using that, even though there's a lot of like stuff that I've changed about this. But anyway, you can find that as Win ASM Tut. I got there by searching for Paul Wang, but it's actually Jeff. Jeff Wang ASM Tut right here. I'll put some links below the video if I can. And then you scroll down to page 14 of the PDF here, and you can see more assembly in Windows. Here are some more resources to expand your knowledge of assembly and Windows programming string manipulation, which I have already done a video about uh, narrow and wide strings in Windows, where I was typing in the editor and all that. And I was going to kind of pick up where that one left off and do like some live coding, but I tend to take too long when I do that. And there's so much to like unpack yet try not to unpack, you know, with all this stuff. I just want to keep it as simple as possible and focus on the core essentials. So I am going to cover um, all of the basic string manipulation techniques, especially regarding like 32 bit windows ish kind of programming. Of course, this can pan over to 64 bit and Linux and stuff like that too. But um, that's, that's just where the direction I'm leaning with it. I'm going to go over a few different ways to copy strings. I'm going to very briefly scratch the surface about uh, scanning and comparing strings. If I mean, not very much at all, but just briefly mention those. And uh, I'm going to go over some start to like dip our toes into some optimization stuff across all these files up here i have like this is um 8086 integer instruction set timings from the beginning of time to through the pentium processor and i think that's pretty good for especially the masm 32 kind of world because that's sort of the era that you want to make sure and cover and plus, when you get into timings beyond that, things just get really weird, in my opinion. And then uh, right here's that good old Agner Fog stuff, which I have covered in previous videos. I'm going to actually dive into those regarding like string and memory copies and the AMD and Intel optimization guides as well. And I'm not going to get deep into them, but I am going to give you enough pointers to where you can sort of dive into these on your own and start to read them. Um, especially with the AMD and the Intel optimization reference manual, you probably think those are more official and more accurate, but they suck. I'll just tell you that right now. There's a few little gems you can scrape up out of them, but they've been around since the beginning of time and they have been irregularly sort of updated and, you know, it, it's just, they've become a big mess in my opinion now. So they're, they're inconsistent. The information just isn't good. Agner Fogg, if you had like one go-to resource, it'd probably be him. And surprisingly, the MASM32 package, if you're using like the official Windows packaging of like Visual Studio Build Tools 2019 or something, I'd suggest still go and download MASM32 just at least for these little help files because they're pretty cool. And that's kind of where I'm going to start with things is between that and using the uh, this Paul or Jeff Wang tutorial to sort of kick us off into that. So anyway, rewind back to the beginning. String manipulation, that's what we're talking about. This is a high level overview with some touches on the optimizations. So string arrays of characters are an essential part to any program. They are usually helpful if you want to display text or ask, okay, I think we know what they're good for. Uh, they use the following registers, ESI, EDI, ECX, EAX, E flags, direction flag. So uh, this will be the source index. This would be, with the E in front of it just stands for extended, I guess. And that just means like basically the 32 bit register, but really, and in 64 bit, that would be an R in 16 bit, 
there wouldn't be anything there. So anyway, that's why you can just ignore the E for the most part. Uh, so you have source index, destination index, the counter, the uh, accumulator, or just your basic all-purpose register, and then the flags direction, the DF flag, which says which way you want to go through those strings if you want to go backwards to front or front to back and all that good stuff. And so, of course, the source, like if we're going to be doing, especially focusing on copying a string, then the source is obviously going to be the original string. Destination is going to be some bytes. So in the MASM code, if you were to just do a real quick, simple example, you just have like a, a hard-coded constant string, like hello world or something. And then the destination could be a bunch of duplicate undefined bytes or a bunch of zeros or whatever, really, as long as it's writable. And then the, the ECX we use as a counter. So if we want to copy 10 bytes or 10 characters or 10 wide characters, which would be words, two bytes at a time, we'd fill the ECX, the counter, up with however many of those characters we want to copy. And then, as you'll see, these instructions will automatically decrement or increment that register appropriately. The direction flag is to specify which direction. Some common string instructions are uh, mov string byte, move string byte, compare string byte. Uh, was, that's a misprint. That's supposed to be scan right here. I believe. I don't think there is a a stas byte, whatever. So that's supposed to be scan string byte and then store string byte. So uh, this is, of course, moving and copying strings in ASM. Of course, when we say move, we really just mean copy. And uh, compare string is when you want to compare two different strings, byte for byte. Um, the scan string, which is actually this one, is scanning a string for a specific character. And then this one is to set a character in a string. So this rep store string byte is really good if you want to like initialize a whole string or an array or something of all zeros for instance that's pretty much the simplest fastest most efficient way to do that um, this chart basically tells you what's going on there to manipulate strings you use some form of rep on a string instruction so this rep prefix just informs the microcode because the intel amd x86 processors are what's called a CISC, a CISC, a complex instruction set. Is that? I don't, I think that's it. Sit downs for something like that. But anyway, um, what reduced instruction risk is reduced instruction set. Oh, it's complex instruction set computing, I believe. And uh, what that basically says is that. You can have a cool thing like mob string byte or whatever, and then under the hood, once you send that character, the uh, like that macro operation to the processor, then it breaks it down into like a bunch of micro code ops. And so, what that does basically is it it's doing more under the hood. Like even assembly language, even though we think of that as pretty much like the lowest abstraction level of languages it's still on like an Intel AMD processor, it's still fairly high level a lot of times. Um, on a RISC type of uh, CPU architecture, which would be something maybe more like the ARM processors that you find, especially in mobile devices, even though they do have like the most modern day CISC processors like Intel AMD, do have a lot of risk features and vice versa on the other side of the aisle there um the arm risk processors have borrowed from the cisc processors so it's not like a black and white thing anymore it's just sort of like you could think of it like the cpu architectures are sort of leaning one way or the other but there's a lot of overlap these days um and that being said uh, like a pure risk architecture would be like one instruction, one cycle, you know, you'd have to literally do everything. You'd have to move each byte into a register or each word or whatever value you're working with and then do something with that. You just have to do it the long, hard way or at least have macros that are doing the long, hard way, software macros doing the long, hard way under the hood for you or something. 
um, with CISC, a lot of times there's ways to bypass it, or of course, speaking of that overlap, there are ways to go in more granular, granularly and uh, deal with it as well. So if we scroll down here a little bit more, this, if you're just looking for a simple way, like you want to do a pure Intel AMD style way of just copy a string, be done with it, move on with your life without having to dip into the C library or without having to look at all these PDF tabs I have open, this right here is the way to do it. Oop, sorry, this Firefox uh, PDF viewer is so goofy sometimes it just, you click on a page and it starts bouncing around. So I apologize in advance for that. Uh, so basically what's going on here is we're clearing the direction flag and that's what you want to do with most string instructions. You want to do that right out the gate. That way you make sure that, or you want to set the direction flag if you do want to move backwards, but usually you want to clear it. As you'll see in a moment, uh, moving forward through a string is quicker than moving backwards through a string. And that's one thing, like if you, like I used to think with high level languages, like maybe C programming or whatever, that you get to that thing, like if you're doing like a for loop through a string or something, and then you're doing, well, it's less than or equal to, then da 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 da, right? And it's like, well, I don't want to do that less than or equal to because then I'm doing two operations. I'm testing whether it's less than, and then I'm testing whether it's equal to. And uh, maybe if I just move through the string backwards, then I can just say, you know, while it's, you know, maybe doing something like that. Anyway, that's something I've thought in the past. And I, it was a trip to come in and look at the lower level workings of the x86 architecture. And that's completely not true. For one thing, the uh, condition, the um, conditional instructions, let's see here. So this right here is the, uh, I just typed in Pentium timings. There's this one down here, x86 timing. I'm not a big fan of that one, but this one up here, 8088 through Pentium, this is a good one. Or, I don't know, the other one deals with a little bit more modern CPUs, especially AMD, but this one right here for what we're doing is what's up. And you can read all these to, if in case you're not familiar with like, you know, immediate 8-bit value, you know, these are all the different types of operands that each instruction could take right here. And then, what matters most to us right now is, well, I guess all of it kind of matters, but like this is something to take note of, which is saying that whether or not stuff is parable, this was in the Pentium computer. So what happened was if you look at these, here's the ASCII adjust after edition, any reference you see for the Intel style assembly language, that's pretty much always the first instruction you see, right? And then if you come in here, it says the byte size of the instruction. It says how many cycles it took for the original 8088, and then the 186, the 286, which was like right before that. These were all the 16-bit, the original early 80s 16-bit processors. And then the 386 was the mid 80s when they finally did a 32-bit. This was like 1989, 1990, the 486 came out. And then a couple years later, the Pentium, the original Pentium came out. So the ones we're most worried about or care about are these ones over here, the 3D6, 46, and Pentium. These are the 32-bit architectures. And of course, the architecture that most all, probably the desktop computer in front of you is based on is the Pentium 2 architecture or the Pentium Pro, which was the one right after this. And you might be surprised and think like, wow, that's from like the 1996, you know, that was going on 25 years ago now. And you would think there would be something newer and there sort of is, it's been extended and stuff, but they actually went back to that architecture because it was just more power efficient and stuff like that. So that's what all the processors now. So even in MASM, when you see like I686 or whatever, or dot, 686 for the highest instruction set you can unlock that's it i mean that that's the p6 architecture that's pretty much where we're at so and then you can do other things like dot x mm and stuff like that to unlock sse which are those extensions after that
Okay, so this is saying that this one takes four cycles on the 386, and it only takes three cycles on the 486, and also three cycles on the Pentium, and it's not parable. So what happened with the 386 was like 386 was, like I said, it's the first generation of 32-bit processors. It was really cool when it came out, but it doesn't have things like uh, the on-chip cache. I mean, I'm pretty sure it has an L1 cache seems like it has to have an L1 cache. Wow, I, I don't even remember. Um, but the 486 has a cache. Maybe it doesn't. I'm, I've, maybe all of its caches are off chip. I just was reading about this, but I've been reading so much that I've like chased my tail and I'm confused about what was when and stuff. But anyway, what the 486 offered was it offered like pipelining where you could as soon as you start to like decode and execute one instruction then you start fetching and decoding the next instruction immediately after it so that's it's a tight pipeline so it's not like you don't unpack and execute an instruction and then uh you know do all that stuff and then finally go fetch the next instruction unpack it execute it whatever stages of the cpu it has to go through with the 486 as soon as that instruction gets unpacked and it immediately is fetching you know the next instruction and unpacking it immediately behind it as much as possible that's pipelining what the pentium did was it actually added a feature called a super scalar pipeline which means that you could actually potentially do two of the same stages of the pipeline at the exact same time <clears throat> excuse me so you could potentially execute two instructions at the same time. 486, you could do them back to back, like one cycle away, but Pentium, some stuff at the same time. So anyway, that's to describe what parable means here, whether or not you can pair two, uh, two instructions together. So by pairing them, you basically do two things at once. You do in one cycle, you're doing two things, which is pretty trippy, right? So this little MP right here, if we scroll down and find something a little more applicable to strings, like a mob instruction or something like that. Okay, we got compare. So like if we were comparing uh, whether or not we're at the zero, a null zero at the very end of the string right there, that would be like a compare, right? And so we can see here with the Pentium and the 486, for one thing, that compare operation only takes one cycle and the 386, it takes two big deal but right here you can see this uv so this mp means not parable this uv means that it's parable this instruction is parable in the u and the v pipes i guess you would call them yeah the u pipe or the v pipe and uh otherwise and basically what it is if you think of them in alphabetical order like the u pipe comes before the v pipe so the first instruction has to be a u parable instruction it i mean it gets technical and there's a bunch of like ifs ands or buts around it and stuff like that but i just want to introduce that because then you can dig in on your own i wouldn't recommend trying to like come up with the most optimal thing right out of the gate keep it short and simple that's the number one principle for programming do that that's why i said just go with this right here this doesn't matter about any of the stuff I'm talking about right now. That does not apply to this. I'm just sort of jumping ahead for a second to kind of show what's going on there. So, and to explain that you can pair up instructions and run two instructions at a time on the, you know, modern day processors and stuff like that. Okay, so what this is doing is it's clearing the direction so that it can move forward. Oh, and the, sorry. The other thing I wanted to show you was that the jump instructions. So basically, if you're doing like that for loop and you're saying, well, it's less than or equal to, right? Or uh, jump if greater or equal, for instance, right here, right? Well, if we come down here, or where is the jump? I guess it's up a little bit here. So this is JCC, jump on conditional code. And if you look right here on the 486 and Pentium, it's a one cycle. So it can jump, it can do this greater than or equal to test on one cycle. And then that compare code, you know, that was also just a cycle or two or whatever. So 
like in two cycles it does that it's just it's nothing and to move backwards jumping back to here if we were to move backwards it is a lot slower for some reason the way that the uh, underlying architecture works within those cpus it's significantly slower so ideally you want to move forward don't worry about the greater than or equal to because if your uh you know your interpreter your compiler is at all optimized which you know stuff today usually is it, it's mapping directly to those kinds of op codes and for the most part that seems to be true on other architectures as well or at least it's not any worse on other architectures as well but i don't take my word on that i'm no expert at all okay and then after you clear that direction flag the next thing you're going to do is copy the source the you know you basically would define a byte somewhere up in the top of your asm file and you'd have like your little string there and then you'd copy that offset into the uh, source index right and then you do the same thing right after that for your destination where you're going to write those bytes to in your destination index and then you'd copy the length and you could just use like the length of operator in MASM to copy the length into ECX so that it knows how many repetitions to run and then you call this rep mov s and sometimes you'll see that written as just mov s and sometimes you'll see it written mov s b sometimes you'll see it written mov s w mov s d maybe even mov s q on a 64 bit but mov s is just the generic way to say whichever one of those you know like this is sort of at your option that be there and byte if you're doing a narrow ANSI ASCII string you might want to just go ahead and use byte especially if you're going to test for that null character and then this ECX value will line up with the exact amount of characters plus the null character that you're going to go ahead and copy but if you want to be more optimal, the best thing to do is to go ahead and like in our situation we're programming 32 bit specifically, make that B a D for a double word instead of a byte. That will copy four bytes at a time, but then you'd need to divide this value, this length value by four that you put into there because obviously you're moving four bytes at a time. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that for now. And that's what what you do there that code right there will work you can copy a string and be done with it um, and the file management stuff we're not going to get into right now so going from there I'm going to tell you a few other ways that you can sort of unpack this to maybe like right here this can't this can only deal with the fixed length string right this can't deal with the null character or whatever this is just the most generic way to do it if you know the length of the string kind of thing whatever but okay here's where I'm going to jump back to that MASM 32 documentation which will be on whatever drive you installed it to MASM 32 help folder and then MASM intro and MASM 32.chm and you could just like double click on both of those and those should open up in a help file viewer for you and this one oh, of course my mouse is going to cut out on me right now this one is the what do we have here here's that intro one right that MASM intro and you can see there's this working with strings here click on that and it says 32-bit windows string data is almost exclusively zero terminated strings so that leads us to kind of a problem if we're going to use that rep move only um, there are other forms of string data used but most windows api call work with uh, zero terminated strings it's worth noting that string manipulation can be performed on any byte sequence not just character data that's a good point because uh, you know strings that's exactly what it is it's a string of bytes or a string of words or whatever you know it might happen to be character data but not necessarily this technology of zero terminated strings is reasonably old but fundamentally simple in its structure very economical in memory and in processing terms it can be done in assembler both well and fast 
The form that strings are allocated in the dot data section is as follows, and that goes for uh, dot const as well. So your string name, define byte, or if you're doing wide strings, it would be a DW for define word. Um, you'll, you'd have to do each individual character in quotes with commas between it if you're defining it as a word, or see my other video about writing a macro to make it be a nice pretty plain old string just like in high level languages like that. And then a comma zero to put your trailing null character there. And you could also do like a 13 comma 10, for, uh, similar to like the ODOA for the carriage return and line feed if for some reason you need that. But for the most part, this is a narrow ANSI ASCII string in Windows. And if you're new to dealing with strings, I suggest you just stick with that for now. And then maybe once you get that working and whatever you're trying to do down here with it, then go ahead and bump it up and try and do the define word style thing for wide character Unicode character style. The normal data type for zero terminated strings is byte data, and a zero terminated string can be addressed as a byte array in memory. Um, that's this kind of old fashioned here, it, just as much it could be word data as well. There are many instances when processing string data where no terminator is used. Working with binary data requires that you keep track of the length of the byte data. So that's that rep command, obviously you have that length. The older approach is to use the built-in string instructions in 32-bit code. The string instructions use the source index, ESI, which we just covered, and the destination index, EDI, and the counter uh, register as the loop counter. The string instructions in this pre-built loop technique are used with the prefix instructions rep, uh, rep while equal, and rep while not equal which repeat the action of the string instruction until a condition is met. So I'm trying to be careful not to say stuff that it, I'm just might repeat by reading this, but so rep is going to repeat until ECX EC equals zero, excuse me. And then um, what happens is each time it repeats this mov command or the mov s, I should say the move string byte, it will decrement or increment in this case, it's we cleared the direction flag, which sets the direction flag to zero, which makes it move forward. So it's going to increment each one of these. Each time it runs this, it will it will grab the byte from here. It will put that byte in there, and then it will increment the offset that each of those points to, and then it will decrement that by one. And rep will just cause it to do that over and over until that equals zero in there. So you need to make sure, like it says right here, a simple copy example shows how this is done. It is assumed that the destination buffer is large enough to receive the byte count in source. So this would be equivalent, roughly speaking, to memcopy in the standard C library the non-safe version because it doesn't check that the source necessarily check that the source destination is going to be big enough to uh, hold the data and you could end up overflowing or overriding stuff that you don't want to so this is virtually identical to what we just saw over in the Paul Huang or Jeff Huang thing right here clear set the source set the destination set the length and repeat move and then we come back over here, clear the thing, set the source, set the destination, set the length, and then this is a comment, of course, and then we repeatedly move string byte. In this example, move string byte copies each byte from the source index to the destination index, decrements the counter, and exit. the exit condition for the rep prefix is when ECX decremented to zero. When you copy a zero terminated string, you can write an algorithm that copies until it finds an ASCII zero or a wide string zero, a word zero, which is still an ASCII zero, I guess. Okay, so this is basically going to, this is the second way of doing it. This was the first way, and we can see it's similar. We clear the direction flag, then we set the source in uh, ESI, the destination office offset and EDI and then they set a label right here 
because they're going to loop around back to that label. You can call it something different if you want. And then what it's doing is it's loading a string byte and then storing a string byte. So it's sort of decomposing, so to speak, what's going on in this mov string byte here. That's what you could just think of this as a decomposed version of, excuse me, of this, of this, uh, this line right here. So what it's doing is loading a byte from the source into AL and increment the source index. And then it writes that byte or yeah, that byte in AL to the destination and increments the uh, destination index after it writes it, of course. And then it compares to see if it's an ASCII zero. So it's comparing uh, zero to what's in the AL register. And if it's not equal to a, if this, whatever is in this register is not equal to a zero, then we're going to jump back to label and keep going because that means we're not, we haven't found that terminating null zero at the end of the string. Okay. So that's option two of how to copy a string. It says a trick that will make this algorithm run faster is to directly move each byte from the source address to AL and then from AL to the destination address. On Pentium and later processors, it is faster to use MOV Inc than load, store, load and store byte. This is done by quote unquote dereferencing both ESI and EDI so that they function as memory addresses. It should be noted that the direction flag does not affect this method and you can use any 32-bit registers when you're not using string instructions. So basically what they're saying is that this third option down here is going to decompose this even a little bit further. On 386s and older processors, this would be the more ideal way to do it. Um, but down here on 486s and Pentiums and newer ones, this one, because of that pairing thing I was talking about, you don't really have to even know what's going on with pairing, just knowing that this takes advantage. If you didn't quite wrap your mind around what I was talking about earlier, this is gonna, even though it's decomposed and looks a little bit more like raw assembly language, it's a little bit, you know, you definitely have to come in and think about what's going on more where this one, is a little bit more legible, right? It's like load string byte, store string byte, check it for zero, jump if it's not equal to zero back around, and it kind of makes sense. See if I can get them both in view here. So on this one, we don't have to clear the direction because what we're doing effectively is we're incrementing. You could decrement, you could start at the end and decrement it, um, but in this particular example, it's incrementing. So everything's raw in this. And they just happen to be using ESI and EDI for the source and destination. Since this, since they aren't using a string operation per se now, everything's decomposed. They're basically pointed out that you could use like uh, EBX and ECX right here if you really wanted to. But this isn't really a bad idea since these are considered general purpose registers, especially when you're not using a string instruction. Um, but since we're using them four strings and so similarly to a string instruction it just basically makes sense to go ahead and keep using them in the same exact fashion so once again you put the offset of the source move it into ESI you put the offset of the destination into the destination index set a label to loop to and then you move that first byte or if you wanted to do move into AX you could do a whole word or you know, if you really wanted to uh, get even a little more optimized with it, you could move a whole, uh, you know, a double word at a time or something. But then you just have to do the math and remember that it's not character for character anymore. But it, in theory, should be more efficient to do it like that. But anyway, so we copy that byte that's at the location pointed to. That's what these little dereferencers these little brackets are dereferencing this and saying, hey, this is actually a memory address stored in here, so don't copy that memory address value into AL. Uh, dereference that mem memory address, go get the byte wherever that's at in memory, and then move that into the uh, the low the low word of the excuse me, the low byte of the A register.
of the AX register, if you want to think of it like that, or the EAX. And then increment the uh, what this is pointing to, just like it did up here. You know, it, it copied that byte into AL, and then it automatically incremented it. So that's where you can see where that that uh, micro code's kicking in under this under the seams there. That's sort of this is sort of what it's converting to more or less under the under the hood there. And then you do the same thing where you take that um, what's now maybe the first letter of hello world, the capital H, and then you go get the address that we stored in here, and you dereference it, and you copy that byte to that memory address and not just into the register itself. And then go ahead and increment that register so that it's now pointing at the next byte so that that should make sense that they're all ready to point the next one. But before we jump, make sure that we didn't just copy the uh, that null terminating zero. And if we didn't, if it's not equal, then loop back around and just keep on cycling through that there. So the thing is that they mention here is they say on Pentium and later processors, it's faster to move. It's faster to use mauve ink, which is this method right here. You're mauving, inking, mauving, inking, right? Or moving and incrementing is what that means. That's faster than this load and store. So if we come over here to this other uh, HTML help file that we have, this one was the uh, the MS MASM 32.chm file, if I remember correctly. And if yours is open like that, that's fine and everything. But come down here and go to Pentium optimization and click that. And you'll notice like the lines are kind of wrapping around all ugly. So what you can do is click this hide thing. And then this is actually a different file. Let's shrink that down so it's more obvious. So you click hide, it's still wrapping around and then you can maximize, re-maximize that window. And then you can see that gets rid of that line wrap. So that's how to kind of make that look prettier so that you can see what's going on. And this is Pentium. It's not just Pentium optimizations. It's pretty much optimizations for everything but especially 486 and Pentium kind of stuff so we can scroll down here and we can find some of those things like we we're talking about the load and store right so let's go find that the load and store so here's load uh, string byte load string word load string double word as you can see they just all refer back to the other one it's just basically are you moving a byte at a time are you moving a word at a time are you moving a double word at a time that's all it is and if you are doing something you know if you're dealing with those narrow strings and you decide to move like a double word at a time you got to remember you're actually moving four bytes at a time so as far as incrementing and decrementing just keep that in mind but anyway this column right here is telling you what this optimization applies to so it's saying where you would use where you might be tempted to use that if you're using a 486 or higher processor which would be pentiums and all modern stuff today then maybe you might want to use these instructions in this column right here instead and this is the reason why so what you would have done but if you're using these consider this and this is why so load string is only one byte long and is faster on the original PC through the 386 through that first uh, generation 32-bit processor but it's much slower on the 486 on the Pentium the mov inc or mov add instructions pair taking only one cycle. So that's where we can jump back over here to that uh, 8086 integer instruction set clocks.pdf file and we can come down to the mov inc. We'll go down to like mov. Probably repeating again. Well, what would we do last time? Like compare and jump. So maybe mov will be a little different. Excuse me. All right. So mauve, which we can see on the original 386 move data. Um, this is if you're moving register to register, memory to register, register to memory, memory to immediate or constant value. Like if you type in like a five or something in source, a hard coded value, that's what an immediate value is. Um, and then this is memory to accumulator. So that's the very specific accumulator register, right? That all purpose one. Uh, not parable if there's display. Okay. 
So which one would we be doing? We'd be moving, originally we'd be going from a memory to a register. So memory to register. And then we come over here to 3D6, it would be two cycles on the 46 and Pentium. It's only a single cycle and it pairs in both the uh, under the Pentium and the 46 it's back to back that's why it's only one cycle because it's like bam the next cycle it's already got the instruction decoded and it's ready to execute um and the Pentium it's also highly optimized like that but it also takes advantage of that super scalar being able to execute two instructions at once this means it can be the first or the second instruction U means it has to be the first instruction and V means it is the second instruction if I have that right I'm pretty sure I do but never take my word for anything um, so what that means is if we since MOV what they're saying is that pairs so we can go to the increment and we know that's one cycle BAM it pairs it can go UV just pretty means like pretty much means it's gonna pair no problem um, so we'll go back up to I, this is in alphabetical order. And we get increment here, and we can see on the 46 we're incrementing. Let's just say we're doing a an 8-bit register, you know, the AL, just to keep it easy. But you can see it pretty much is identical for all of them. Um, it takes one cycle on the 486 and Pentium, and bam, UV. So it's just, it's going to it's going to work and it's going to work beautifully so that's where you get that pairing there so when we go back over to that table scroll this down a little bit here and we can see that this mauve and this ink these two instructions they're going to pair up and they're going to it's going to realize what's going on and it's going to send them through and execute them at the exact same time which is a trip and then it's going to do the same thing there so this is going to happen in one cycle this is going to happen in one cycle and believe it or not even this should happen in one cycle because of like what we looked at earlier was that the compare followed by a jump of not equal should be able to um, pair as well so that's only three cycles for that right there and then let's go look and compare that to like just the load single byte load string byte uh, what do we got here? Load string byte. Oh, this isn't the right one, is it? Where's the timings? Load string byte. Load string byte right here. On the Pentium, it's two and it's not parable. On a 486 and lower, it's five or more cycles. But we'll just say, you know, and on modern. Uh, CPUs it could vary you know so it might be more cycles but a lot of times they make up for those extra cycles by having increased uh, speed of the processor and stuff like that but uh, anyway it's gonna take two cycles just for that are we that looks like it's the right one there's no little other examples so I'll jump back over there yeah just that alone is gonna take two cycles so it's already done all that by the time it's just done thinking about that, this computer's already, or this method's already down here ready to compare whether or not and loop back around. But this one's gonna have to go to store or string byte. Let's see how many cycles that would be over here. Down on S. Store. So store uh, string byte three so it takes a, an extra cycle even one more extra cycle so this is five cycles total so this is already looped back around four five this is already on its second inter iteration and ready to compare the next byte again by the time this one's just storing the second byte so do you see how that unpacks and that's not a big deal if you're just copying like one string and you're using them at all computer made in this century and stuff like that it you're not even going to notice the difference right but if you're doing something like if you're writing a a new web server in assembly language or something where it's constantly dealing with like copying as much strings around as fast as it possibly can like you know getting tons of hits on the web server and stuff like that then you 
are very likely going to go in and optimize like how fast or you know some type of text processing or copying thing or whatever you can imagine where you're dealing with like a lot of string copying that's where you're going to want to zoom in and be like hey you know i could cut this down to a fraction a tiny fraction of the cycles that some simple code like up here this uh repeat mob string byte another thing that i don't think i mentioned was there's a setup cost to that and that's what i'm gonna go ahead and spring into here so in agner fogs optimizing assembly which you can just search for agner fog online and find his page if you have it and then he's got some uh let's see here Of course, my thing's going to run really slow, so I'll just cancel that. And But yeah, you can find this. This is optimizing subroutines in assembly language. In case you haven't seen that, I'm just going to hit Control-F right here and search for string. And you can see string instructions for all processors, 16.9. I'm going to click on that and then just start reading. String instructions without a repeat prefix are too slow and should be replaced by a simpler instructions. Oh man. The same applies to the loop instruction. With all of these optimization guides, I think they've like tripped over their tongue so much that they don't there's I without a repeat prefix or with a repeat prefix. I don't know. You got to read it for yourself and make up your own mind, but take each little thing kind of for a grain of salt, you know. Um there's a lot of misprints and stuff in these things, but Agner gets it better than Intel and AMD do, it seems like. This same applies to the loop instruction and to the jump, oh, what does that mean? Okay, jump if ECX is zero is what that means. So that's another thing where you can just go back over these timings and just look at what the timings are on stuff and everything. So repeat, move string, double word, and repeat, store string, double word are quite fast if the repeat count is not too small. Um, the largest word size D word in 32-bit mode, Q word in 64-bit mode is preferred, but of course, just make sure you get that counter right. Um, both source and destination should be aligned by the word size or better. That's not even necessary on the newest processors, but you know, pretty much everything in this that was manufactured in this century, you don't even have to align it anymore. It does it just somehow automatically under the hood is able to do a lot of that. In many cases, however, it is faster to use vector registers. The vector registers are going to be like your MMX, your SSE, stuff like that, um, which I'm not covering just yet. I'm leaning towards a 3D6 without a math coprocessor is where I'm trying to keep these tutorials leaning towards. Moving data in the largest available registers is faster than a repeat move string double word and a repeat store string double word in most cases, especially on older processors. Note that while repeat move string instruction writes a word to the destination, <laughs> if it be, I think he meant to pay it repeat, mob s w it writes a word to the destination it reads the next word from the source in the same clock cycle that's a good point this may cause cache bank conflicts on some older processors the easiest way to avoid cache bank conflicts is to align both source and destination by eight so basically on if you are dinking around with processors or just want to be cool and write code that runs smoothly on old processors then you'll want to keep this stuff in mind and one thing too with the the rep mov is that you can fill a whole cache line which would be like 16 bytes on a 486 it would be like 32 bytes on a pentium and then i think or no at some point it became 32 bytes on like a pentium or pentium 2 or something and then uh from the Pentium 4 and beyond, it was 64 bytes. So all modern processors, a cache line size is going to be 64 bytes. It may not read that entire cache line in one cycle, especially like on my AMD processor, it actually reads it in two cycles, whatever. But uh, a cache line is just something you want to completely fill, ideally, and then things work optimally. 
I'd suggest reading about that more on your own. That's where this rep mov string for like large strings, if you're working like that, it actually can become one of the more ideal choices, even though it started to seem like it was stupid from the stuff that we were reading earlier. That's something to keep in mind there. Um, quite fast by moving 16 bytes or entire cache line at a time. This happens when certain conditions are met. Depending on the processor condition for fast string instructions, typically that the count must be high, both source and destination must be aligned, which isn't true anymore, but you know, if you want to go ahead. The direction must be forward and the distance between the source and destination must be at least the cache line size and the memory type for both source and destination must be either right back or right combining. You can normally assume the latter condition is met. Under these conditions, the speed is as high as you can obtain with vector register moves. So whenever you see vector, oh, that's the MMX and SSE and stuff like that. Well, I don't get that. Why some bug in Firefox makes it jump around like that. Okay, why this, while the string instructions can be quite convenient, it must be emphasized that other solutions are faster in many cases. If the above conditions for fast move are not met, then there's a lot to gain by using other methods. See page 150 for alternatives to repeated mobs, um, repeated loads, repeated scans, repeated compares, take more time per iteration than simple loops. So that's what we were looking at was how we had done more of like a simple loop there. Um, looking down at my notes here. Okay. And here's the vectorized string instructions if you do want to read about that. So you can see that is going to take SSE 4.2 or higher, which I would say pretty much maybe every, most every computer made in the last decade or so probably has that. And uh, yeah, you could just, you're just moving more at once than, you know, instead of doing a little bite or two at a time. So anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on that. You can come in here and study it for yourself, of course. Where is that page 150 link at? Huh. It didn't take us to page 150. Whatever. Vectorized string instructions, 141. Between Firefox and Chrome or Chromium browsers, I just, they both are so buggy in ways that, like if they if they both combined forces, then it would be the ultimate browser. Probably better they don't though. Any day now, get down here to page 150. So 150 is going to be moving blocks of data. Just how they were saying that, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be string data. This is a little bit more focused around the idea of maybe that it's just sort of described as memory blocks instead of um, string bytes or whatever, but same basic concepts. There are several ways of moving. Most common is the rep mov, which was the very first one we covered. Uh, if data are aligned, read and write the data of the largest register size, whatever. Anyway, there's more of that stuff. I don't want to spend a zillion years on that. Here's the micro architecture of Intel AMD NVIDIA CPUs. Also by Agner Fogg, it's under the micro architecture PDF file there. So I'm going to search this one for pair. Control F, search it for pair. And you can see Pentium 1 and Pentium MMX which are both Pentium 1. This just had the decomposed FPU that was better than... Uh, anyway, it's just early SSE kind of stuff. Pairing integer instructions. You come down here, this kind of just describes in more detail what I was talking about in pairing in case you want to read into that. The Pentium 1 and the Pentium MMX have two pipelines for executing instructions called the U-pipe and the V-pipe. You know, the U and V are as far as I know, it's just completely arbitrary, just like how there's an EAX and an ECX and da 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 registers. You know, it's just what they call them. Just think about them in alphabetical order, and that's about all you got to know about that. Under certain conditions, it's possible to execute two instructions simultaneously one in the U pipe and one in the V pipe. This can almost double the speed. <laughs> 
I'd say it definitely doubles the speed. It is therefore advantageous to reorder the instructions to make them pair. So that's an optimization. Don't try and do that off the top of your head every time you write code. You know, just go back in those parts you really care about. Get it working first, then profile, then tune and optimize. Okay, the following instructions are parable in either pipe. So these would be like, if we come back over here, this would be UV pipe. And this, uh, it's not a, like a definitive list. He doesn't seem to list them all, but these are some of them. Uh, the MOV, push, pop, load effective address, a no op, increment, decrement, add, subtract, compare, and or, exclusive or, and some forms of test. Those, you know, they can go either way. So it doesn't matter. Like down here, it says that, um, Two consecutive instructions will pair when the following conditions are met. One, the first instruction is parable in the U pipe, and then second instruction is parable in the V pipe. So that's where I was saying, like, think about them in alphabetical order, because that U comes first. So if an instruction says over here that it's, uh, let's find one, like UV, right, for test, just like he had said in his document. So this means that it can come, oh, wow, there it goes, I clicked on it jumped around okay XOR <laughs> so UV right there that U means that this instruction can come first and be parable and V means or it can come second to another to a U parable instruction if that makes sense and the second instruction does not read or write to a register which the first instruction it writes to except for the flags register that's the one it exception to that but anyway you can go through and you can see there's like a dozen rules or whatever that of things that can make stuff parable or not and everything like that um special rules for mmx imperfect pairing whatever all that stuff's in there this really cool micro architecture guide to just read about stuff like you can even just start at the beginning of this document and um I guess it's going so slow because I'm recording video. What a piece of junk. Okay, let me just click on introduction. Yeah, you can come down here and see, these are basically just the CPUs that he kind of mentions and then what they're called versus what he calls them. So you can see up here P5, which would be a 586 effectively he calls it the pentium the p1 for the pentium one these are more of like the layman's terms over here and these are more of like the actual architecture names that they were called so you can see p6 right here was the pentium pro the pentium 2 the pentium 3 and then when you get down here to like the uh, pentium m and all that these are actually p6 based architectures too this pentium 4 net burst this stuff was the stuff that kind of got thrown out later because the Pentium 4 ran too hot and then this second generation Pentium 4 right here was the first like fully 64-bit Intel CPUs but they weren't backwards compatible with the x86 so they got thrown out when AMD came out with a better standard than Intel did and then so basically all this stuff down here is P6 also it's all this P6 right here so that's what I was talking about the what was effectively 686 um, yeah, I think he even tells some of the story in here, maybe about some of that stuff. Out of order execution, that's some of that super scalar kind of stuff in the pipeline. And then the software optimization guy for, from AMD, I'm going to control F and type in string into that. And then you can see repeated string instructions, 8.3. I can click through on that. Avoid rep prefix. Da -da -da, rationale uh, is less than optimal, especially when copying blocks of memory for discussion. See memory copy on page 180. So here's some latencies. Don't take these as set in stone. This was just for a particular generation of AMD specific CPUs. You know, it changes all the time. But just to give you an idea that, you know, the rep mov, even if it's not going to copy anything, even if ECX is already zero, it's still going to take 11 cycles just to put that into perspective, you know? So, and then when uh, ECX is greater than zero, it's going to take 15 cycles of setup plus 
however those are interpreted i don't know i don't want to say and then when you're moving backwards you can see that for the repeated moves and repeated stores it's significantly you know like 40 percent or whatever more i can't even think of math right now but it's a lot more it's was that uh that's like 60 percent more setup code but that's only if you look over here that's only on the ones that are writing on these ones that are uh that are just like loading you know writing out to memory basically these ones that are loading or comparing and like kind of staying more in register world over here they seem to be the same but one of those inconsistencies if you read down further use the largest possible operand size which is saying you know move store d or mov sd whatever um right here right while the string instruction with decrement are slower only the overhead part of the cycle equation is larger and not the throughput part see that spot we were just at and if we go over here it's like i don't know if it's me but here's this should be the uh stupid firefox that should be the setup part right this first part is to my knowledge either way and then the throughput part looks the same because <laughs> this is the one direction go df equals zero this one's df equals one so their table's not consistent with their claims which kind of sucks um aligning and what's weird too is this is amd 64 era and they talk about aligning the source and destination still and by then that was when alignments really stopped mattering around that era so it's weird that they focus on that um I don't know. Like I said, just take any of this for a grain of salt here. I'm going to go back up to the top. I'm going to find the next. That was the 8.3 repeated strings. I think there's another spot. Latency. Yeah. Anyway, that looks like about it. So here's the Intel version of the optimization guide. It's huge. 868 pages for the newest edition, which is May 2020, that I found. Um, if you search online, it's probably going to bring up like the 2016 or 2012 edition before it even gets down to this one, which whatever, those might be more accurate because this one's just as goofy as the other ones. If I do a search for string in here, first thing it's going to give you is those SSE 4.2 like vectorized things, I guess. So I'm going to skip past those and I'm going to come down here. And on uh, 4.6, we got repeated string enhancement. The rep prefix in conjunction with mov store instruction and account value in ECX are frequently used to implement library functions such as mem copy, mem set. These are referred to as rep string instructions. Each iteration of these instructions can copyright a constant value in a byte word d word q word granularity the performance characteristics using rep string can be attributed to two components startup overhead and data transfer throughput the two components of performance characteristics of rep string varies further depending on granularity alignment and or count values generally move string byte is used to handle very small chunks of data therefore processor implementations of Repeated move string bytes are optimized to handle a count of less than four using repeated move string bytes with a count greater than three will achieve low data throughput due to not only byte granular data transfer but also additional startup overhead. Latency for mob string byte is nine cycles if the count is less than four, otherwise Repeated move string bytes with ECX greater than nine have a 50 cycle startup cost. But I don't even trust them. They don't even know their foot from their mouth. Um, but maybe it's true. Seems like it's got to be somewhat true. For rep string of a larger granularity data transfer as ECX value, the startup overhead, whatever, they try and get granular on different startup sizes and stuff. and. The more there is, the more the startup size, but the more it can pay out, whatever. That's just something that I wanted to, uh... oh, oh, come on. Let me go back to the beginning here. 
This piece of junk is ticking me off. All right. Oh, wow. Don't do this. Okay, I'm going to do the search for the... See, it's still at search 200 there. It's like, what is the problem? I'm sorry about this. It should not be taken this long. This is ridiculous. I'm going to jump back over to this AMD one because I know it didn't even... Come on, Firefox, what's your problem? String, it did, it's not even showing us all the string stuff. I know it's skipping stuff. There was another thing in here. Maybe it's my fault. Most likely my fault. So I'm going to go back to this one. Um, they mention in here to use the mem copy. There's 167, low counts. Where's that at? Memory copy on page 120. So, for very fast general purpose memory copy routine, call the libc mem copy function included with Microsoft or GCC tools. This function features optimizations for all block sizes and alignments. So, what they're basically saying is if you're familiar with C programming, you probably thought, hey, this is a lot like mem copy or string copy or whatever. String copy would be like, it would look for the null character mem copy goes based on like a more fixed number of bytes uh, mem copy routines included with recent compilers from microsoft and gcc feature optimizations for all block sizes and alignments for basically the x x86 processor and this is their server line of processors just like intel they always try and push their latest processor instead of just being cool and admitting that it's just the x86 uh, Use inline assembly code to copy small data structure in cache. Use unrolled series of MOV instructions. So basically like what we're looking at over here, um, any of these repeated things like right here, we could actually unroll this and just copy and paste this a bunch of times without the, the jump. Well, it would be a different kind of jump in this circumstance. We'd still want to compare this, but anyway, that maybe is not the best example, maybe down here more. But you could unroll stuff, like if you know, hmm, I can't think of how to put it right now, but I'm sure you can, that unrolling is better than looping because then you don't even have to do a jump, then the next instruction's right there. It can get prefetched. We know it won't have to get kicked out of the pipeline because it will be the proper instruction whatever um sorry this kind of glitchy things got me thrown off and kind of tooting on some stuff here that i had a little bit better idea of how i was going to present it but i don't know i get frustrated when technology doesn't work for me like i want it to one of the other things to keep in mind that they mentioned somewhere in these stupid bloated guides is that, all right, it looks like I can search for this now. Let's see if it's a, so right here's a good example of like another one of those goofy things for small counts using rep prefix is less efficient than not using rep prefix. This is because the hardware does have small rep count optimizations. It's like, oh, it's re it's optimized for small counts, so therefore it's less efficient. That doesn't make sense. But what we just read in that other part, if you remember, it said that for very small counts where like literally three or less, it is optimized. But then there's that little middle ground where it's not just above that but then when you get to really long strings once again it becomes optimized because of cache lines and whatnot so anyway if you're doing a lot of you know if you're moving more than a couple dozen characters in a string or whatever then you can probably just use rep mov s and be good with it i'm gonna go back now and try and go 
copy and string copy here. Okay, this one seems to be pretty mildly written and not not too crazy. So compilers typically provide libraries with mem copy mem set routines that provide good performance while managing code size and alignment issues, which is just what we were reading in that AMD thing. Mem copy and mem set operations can be accomplished using repmov and store instructions with lengths of operation decomposed for optimized byte dword granular operations and alignment considerations. So that's basically like this decomposition we're talking about here. But uh, say that you were moving, if you were moving a D word at a time, then what you'd want to do is at the end of that, what I was trying to get to basically was saying that, um, you know, when you got to those last few bytes of the string, if you were, say, moving a narrow string, then you'd move a D word for as much as possible. Then ideally at the very end, you'd switch and just do mov string byte for the last few bytes. That way you get it exact and you're not sort of misaligning, so to speak. This usually provides a decent copy set solution for the general case. Uh, the rep instructions have a fixed overhead. Rep should be able to cope with line splits for long strings, but rep cannot, rep mov s cannot due to the complexity of the possible alignment matches between source and destination, which is no longer true. Uh, for specific copy set needs, macro code sequence using SIMD instructions can provide modest gains in the order of a dozen clocks or so, depending on the alignment, buffer length, and cache residency of the buffers. Large memory copies with cache line splits are notable exceptions to this rule, where careful macro code might avoid cache line splits and substantially improve on RepMov, uh, which should be RepMov S. Processors based on the Silvermont, blah, blah, blah. Um, software wishing to have a simple default string copy or store routine will work well on a range of implementations, including future implementations, should consider using rep mov string byte, which is all the way back to that simple one right here. They're saying if you want to have it simple and work well on future processors, pretty much stick or lean towards this and forget about it. Uh, although these instructions may not run as fast on specific implementations as more specialized copy store routines, such specialized routines may not perform well on future processors. So everything's always changing uh, and may not take advantage of future enhancements either. So rep mov string byte and rep store string byte will continue to perform reasonably well on future processors. Who knows when that was written? Of course, this is the 2020 version of this document, but this document is probably 20 years old at least, and probably based on documents that were 10 or 20 years old before that. So some stuff just gets copied over. But for the most part, I think that's true. You know, just stick, keep it simple, you know, until you justify that optimization. But like I said, you know, it isn't hard to do once you start thinking about the timings and the pairings on these instructions down here. You can see that, you know, you probably are going to get an optimized thing out of that. Is that it for that one? Okay, so I'm going to shut that one down. And anyway, you can read further into this copying data structure things. I was going to come back over here. What their the AMD and uh, Intel guides were basically recommending was that whether you're implementing these or maybe just use these, not implementing. I'm sorry. Um, of course, you could use what we've been talking about to implement these, but the Microsoft and GCC compilers specifically are known to implement highly optimized versions of mem copy, right? So if you want to just import these, you know, use these libc functions, then just do that. That's another option. And then you're going to kind of get the best of both worlds, even though you are going to have to tie in with the external C library. And, you know, if you're trying to really write that small, tight assembly code, then maybe having a bigger code size isn't what you want. But that being said, for a general purpose that's going to automatically select, you know, for the most part, the most optimal of those, supposedly. 
you can just use the CMEM copy. So that's there. And specifically in the Microsoft world, you can see there's the mem copy, which takes a destination, a source, and then a count for how many bytes or words or whatever you want to move. There's the uh, mem copy and the w mem copy. The w mem copy, think of it as words or wide string. Uh, mem copy, of course, is going to be the narrow ASCII, ANSI strings. And then there's also this mem copy s, which instead of taking just these three, the destination, source, and count, they take the destination, destination size, source, and count. So that's the little safety feature is just they make you plug in the destination size or whatever. Um, it's up to you. And you can also decompose in your own code and implement checks to make sure that, you know, that your destination size is safely adequate to handle all that stuff. And coming back full circle, this is where we're at. If you don't know any better, just use this and forget about it. Here's your basic things. If you want to compare one string to another, you can do that. And what this is going to do is it's going to uh, compare byte for byte, similarly to copying. But instead of copying, it's just comparing. And what it does is it subtracts that uh, the second string by you know the uh, the destination string byte. It's going to subtract that from that source string byte if I have the ordering right on that. Basically, it just finds the difference, subtracting one from the other. And if it's a non-zero value, which means that they're different, then that's going to change your zero flag, that ZF flag. And so you can do repeat while equal, or you can do repeat while not equal on this one too. You know, So you can check to make sure the strings aren't the same. Of course, that's probably a little less common, but it's out there. There's C functions that do that. And, uh, you know, this, so depending on which one of these you use, this will continue. This is the same thing as repeat as rep Z for repeat while zero, which repeats, um, until the zero flag, or excuse me, it, it repeats while the zero flag is set. So that effectively is saying it's equal, right? Because if that zero flag is set, that means that the last comparison operation was zero and that compare is exactly a subtract operation, but it doesn't put the difference in EAX. It just changes the flag, if that makes sense. So, and then repeat while not equal is the same thing as saying repeat while not zero in Z and that just you know well not equal if they're different then there's going to be some non-zero value from the subtraction of the two you know ascii character values or unicode character values however you want to think of that and then um so that's scanning a string for a character so of course that would bounce out if you were looking for a specific character like does this string have the character three in it or the character lowercase a or whatever then it's going to repeat until that's true right and then this repeated store byte like i said before that's the efficient way to go in and just like zero out a whole string right there you just set the size of the string and do that or you could uh, decompose it a little bit and make it check each uh byte or each character each word or whatever in the string and see if it's null it's one way to do that so anyway sorry i started to get a little bit of an attitude there um if you hung in there with me this long i appreciate it and maybe this helped you understand some of the stuff so that you might be a little bit less frustrated than me dealing with it but you're gonna have to dig in you know just dig in as far as you need to i recommend and uh, no further, right? If you have any questions, just leave them in the comment boxes under this video and I'll try and get to them. Thanks a lot.